They say crime doesn't pay, and that's true. Crime absolutely doesn't pay. Well, except for when it does. And that is when you've pulled off an amazing heist. I present to you some of the greatest heists in human history. Some ruined in the craziest ways imaginable, and others so well executed they remain unsolved to this day. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum Heist, $500 million. Art theft is hardly the most novel heist out there. Several important pieces of art have been pilfered from homes and museums all over the world, but an art heist worth $500 million? Now that's something worth talking about. On the night of March 18, 1990, two men posing as police officers forced their way into the museum and made off with over $500 million worth of some of the world's finest paintings and drawings. Eccentric art collector Isabella Stewart Gardner had so nobly opened her magnificent Boston home to the public to display her impressive art collection. And frankly, impressive is an understatement. Gardner's collection was made up of masterpieces such as Rembrandt's The Storm in the Sea of Galilee, Jan Vermeer's The Concert, and other similar timeless masterpieces. Her impressive art collection was assembled after a lifetime of travel and hard work, which only made the ensuing art heist all the more devastating. On the night of the burglary, the two security guards who worked at the museum, Ricker Barth and Randy Hestand, were going about their business on a perfectly routine shift, blissfully unaware that they were about to witness the largest private property theft in American history. At 1.20 a.m., one of the security guards allowed what looked like two police officers to enter the museum who claimed that they were investigating a noise complaint. Eleven minutes later, the two intruders had handcuffed and blindfolded both guards in the museum basement. At this point, it was obvious that these were not policemen. The burglars told them of their true intentions and warned them to stay quiet. And in true Robin Hood fashion, they even promised the security guards a reward in a year if they cooperated. With no one to interfere, the thieves went on a crime spree through the museum, stealing priceless paintings, sculptures, and drawings. They even grabbed a few worthless pieces of art. These thieves weren't exactly art snobs. They didn't discriminate. According to investigators, the burglars, in their haste to grab anything that looked expensive, actually overlooked some of the most priceless paintings and objects in the museum. That didn't stop them from becoming wanted criminals, though. In fact, the bounty on their heads was the largest ever offered by a private institution. Over the years, police have failed to find the men behind the art heist. They've investigated numerous international art thieves and local gangsters, all to no avail. No concrete evidence has ever surfaced. It would seem that these men just vanished into thin air. To this day, the stolen artworks have never been recovered, and the museum still offers a $10 million reward for any information leading to its recovery. And I know what you're thinking. Did the security guards ever get that reward they were promised? Who knows? They sure wouldn't tell you. Mafia's $6 million Lufthansa airline robbery. Next up, we have a heist that could probably never be replicated again today. Not with our omnipresent surveillance systems, especially at the airports. But back in 1978, one of the biggest heists of the time was successfully pulled off, the Lufthansa robbery. Lufthansa is and was a German airline, and the plan was to rob it. This was perhaps the most valuable crime ever committed in the name of the American Mafia. The heist was largely orchestrated by a man named Louis Werner, an employee of the airline, a man who was saddled with an unfortunate gambling problem. Werner and his co-worker Peter Gruenwald had long been planning to steal millions in unmarked banknotes from one of Lufthansa's regular shipments of cash. Now, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. Werner told his bookie, Martin Krugman, about the heist. Why? Well, that's because he owed Martin $20,000 and he intended to repay that debt with the money he would make from said heist. Krugman, the bookie, then took the information to his acquaintance, and it ended up in the ear of a notorious gangster and feared associate of the Lucchesi crime family, Jimmy the Gent Burke. Burke offered to organize the heist on behalf of his patrons in return for a sizable cut, of course. Basically, it was Burke's heist now. He handpicked a crew of associates, which included his own son, Frank. Together, they went off to the Lufthansa cargo terminal at John F. Kennedy International Airport in the early hours of December 11, 1978. It was a quick and easy job. In just over an hour, the crew took six employees hostage and stole nearly $6 million in untraceable cash and jewelry. That's about $23.4 million in today's money. The heist itself wasn't the problem. The aftermath, however, was a different question. It all came undone when their getaway driver Edward Stax Parnell screwed up monumentally. Instead of taking the Ford Econoline van they used in the heist to a Marbone scrapyard in New Jersey, 
Parnell left it parked in front of his girlfriend's house in Brooklyn. This was a pretty grave oversight, no doubt, and it sent Jimmy the Gent Burke into a very ungentlemanly paranoid frenzy. He ordered the murders of all but five of the 13 heist participants to cover his tracks. Ironically enough, Jimmy Burke did eventually go to prison, but on charges completely unrelated to the Lufthansa heist. In the end, the only person to serve time for the heist was Louis Werner, who spent 15 years behind bars for the monumental crime of tipping Burke and his gang off. Only a small portion of the stolen money was ever recovered, and the fate of the rest of the fortune will probably never be known. The $100 million Belgian diamond heist. The city, Antwerp. The country, Belgium. This was the stage for an incredibly audacious diamond heist. The thieves were going to hit Belgium's diamond district, a place that sells roughly 80% of the world's rough diamonds every year, aka the perfect target. The mastermind behind the operation was a professional thief named Leonardo Notarbatorlo. Hitting the largest diamond district in the world was exactly up his alley. The plan was set in motion three years before the actual heist back in the year 2000. Notar Bartolo rented the largest office building in the diamond center he would later be robbing. He even began a completely legitimate trade as a jeweler, but that was just his cover. He was playing the long game. Notar Bartolo used this time working in the Diamond Center to memorize every detail of the building and its security. He assembled a team of thieves with varying skills who had perfected their art in robberies throughout Europe. There was the electronics and alarms expert Elio Donorio, the mechanic and lockpicker Ferdinando Finotto, and Notar Bartolo's childhood friend Pietro Tavano. The final member of the crew was a mysterious key forger known only as the King of Keys. Between the crew and the diamonds were 10 layers of state-of-the-art security, which which included, but was not limited to, multiple cameras that filmed inside and outside the vault, a vault door strong enough to withstand 12 hours of drilling, a light sensor that would trigger an alarm, and a heat and motion sensor that would also trigger an alarm. Yet, despite these odds, on the night of February 16th, 2003, the gang penetrated all 10 layers of security using an assortment of basic materials you can find in your local mall, like hairspray, a broomstick, and electrical tape. The crew made away with jewels worth anywhere from $100 million to over $400 million. They escaped and split up to make their way back to Italy. It would have been the perfect heist too, if it wasn't for one tiny slip-up. Pietro Tavano, Notar Bartolo's childhood friend, was tasked with destroying the evidence. All he had to do was burn the leftover evidence from the heist, like receipts and empty jewelry bags. But instead, he elected to dump it in a forest. The bag of evidence was eventually found. The police were involved, and they managed to use a receipt from a shopping trip to track down Notar Bartolo, who would get 10 years for the robbery, while the rest of the crew each got five. Except for the mysterious King of Keys, his location and the stolen jewels remain a mystery. Out of all the heists on this list, the 2003 Antwerp Diamond Heist deserves to be turned into a Hollywood thriller the most. The details of this heist have got many people, myself included, calling it the greatest heist of all time. The Patriotic Theft of the Mona Lisa. Next, we have the heist of one of the most widely recognized pieces of art in the world, the Mona Lisa, pulled off by a man named Perugia, the ex-handyman at the Louvre. Vincenzo Perugia was a man just shy of his 30th birthday, who worked as a handyman in the Louvre, the world's most visited museum and a cultural landmark in Paris. On the morning of August 21st, 1911, Vincenzo had a completely different intent when he came to work. Although it was his employment as a handyman that let him get away with his plan, Vincenzo was dressed appropriately in the uniform smock all employees wore at the time. He waited until the Salon Carré, the wing where Da Vinci's masterpiece was hung, was empty. Once the coast was clear, all he had to do was simply walk up to the painting, reach out, lift the wooden panel off the wall, and carry it into a nearby service staircase. There, he wrapped the surprisingly small 30 by 21 inch painting in his smock, tucked it under his arm, and just casually walked out. Not only is this the most brazen art theft I've ever heard of, but it's also one of the most unique ever. You see, Vincenzo didn't want to sell the art for millions of dollars, nor did he want to keep it in his house. No. His intentions, if he's to be believed, were a lot nobler than that. Two years after the theft, Vincenzo had successfully taken the painting across the Italian border, where he offered it to a man named Alfredi Gheri, a gallerist in Florence, and was of course promptly arrested. 
When asked why he'd stolen the painting, he claimed that he did it out of patriotism. Apparently, Vincenzo was under the mistaken belief that the Mona Lisa had been looted by Napoleon's troops in the 1790s, when in reality the painting was actually given as a gift to the King of France in 1516. His motivation might seem a little doubtful. After all, he did ask Alfredo Gheri for money in exchange for the painting. Regardless though, his story worked. When put on trial, the court agreed that he committed his crime for patriotic reasons and gave him a lenient sentence. Vincenzo was sent to jail for one year and 15 days, but was hailed as a great patriot in Italy and served only seven months in jail. The Mona Lisa was displayed throughout Italy before returning to the Louvre in 1913. Funny enough, when Vincenzo stole it, the Mona Lisa was one of da Vinci's least known, least impressive, and least valuable works. This particular heist changed all of that, and now it's worth at least $870 million. Leonardo da Vinci is without a doubt one of history's best-known artists, and his most famous painting, the Mona Lisa, is without a doubt his most iconic masterpiece. Basically, it was the perfect target for a heist, and this particular bit of thievery was quite brazen. The 300 million yen Japanese bank heist. To top it all off, I bring you the greatest bank heist in Japanese history. It involved a plan so simple and yet so intricate that the perpetrator was never found to this day. The year was 1968. It was the 10th of December and people were going on about their day. It was business as usual. Well, except for the fact that one of the most trusted banks in Japan, the Nihon Shintaku Ginko, was robbed of 300 million yen, worth about 3 million US dollars today, in the blink of an eye. Like any good heist, this one was planned meticulously and took a long time to implement. It started off when the manager of the bank and those around him started receiving numerous direct death threats over a few months. As time went on, they were getting more intense. Just four days before the actual heist, a letter was sent to the manager's personal residence demanding 300 million yen or his house would be blown up by dynamite. At this point, the police had to be notified. This was a very serious threat after all. The police surrounded both the manager's house and the bank, keeping a very close eye for any potential intruders. This was all part of the plan. The manager had to send four of his employees to the nearby Toshiba factory to make a scheduled drop of roughly 300 million yen packed together in the trunk of a company car. Not Long after leaving the bank, the four employees could hear police sirens coming closer and closer to their vehicle. It was a police officer riding a motorcycle who immediately screeched to a halt in front of the car. What was going on? Well, according to the policeman, the bank manager's home had just been blown up, with several people injured and some presumed dead. And worst of all, the perpetrator was still on the loose and had issued additional threats, meaning the bank was now a target and the employees themselves were at risk. The officer then went down to the ground to search underneath the car. Moments later, one of the employees employees noticed smoke coming from the car, which could only mean one thing, there was a bomb. Before the policeman could even roll out from underneath the vehicle, both employees had already taken to their heels and ran as far away as they could from the vehicle. They took cover behind a nearby wall and waited for an explosion, but none ever came. By the time they came out of cover, the car was gone along with the so-called policeman. It turns out it was all an incredibly well-planned heist. The bank manager and his house were never harmed. It was a signal flare used to mimic dynamite. There were about 120 pieces of evidence deliberately planted at the scene to throw off the police. And of course, that was no policeman that stopped the vehicle in the first place. The case still remains unsolved, with no suspects, and yet, and an investigation that led nowhere. So. What exactly happened? If you enjoyed this video, you should click on a video on the screen. It's crazy good, just like this one. You won't regret it. See you there.